I've noticed in 43 years of ministry that when the enemy attacks us, he never attacks with one thing. Now, I'm going to look at the camera pretty much on this one because I need to focus on them. He never attacks in just one way. It's usually two or three different things because most of us can handle one thing. We can handle one issue, and he knows that. So he'll come at you this way, then he'll come at you another way, then he'll come at you another way. Classic example, we had our first lady bus captain who had been raped on top of one of the high-rise buildings in New York City. Raped, left for dead. Uh, I ended up having to go get her out of the mess. Elevator was broken in the building. I had to carry her down. Fifteen flights of stairs were both covered with blood. It was was horrible. I went from that to to finding one of our assistant pastors dead behind the church on a Sunday morning. We'd closed down a drug house across the street from the church. A couple of the drug dealers tried to come at me with an axe. They were going to kill me. They couldn't kill me, so they killed him instead. Then we went from that to me getting hit with a brick. It was a robbery. guy blindsided me, came up from behind me, hit me with a brick. Right here, broke my cheekbone, broke my teeth out, my front teeth. And I ended up being blind in his eye. For three months, a blood clot had cut off the optic nerve. And notice the pattern, though. So this is what i got to get across to you. It's boom, boom, boom. It's, a, it, it's the enemy coming at you from every direction. And the whole purpose is to get you to quit. Because if you quit, he automatically wins. That's the point of discouragement. And that's what most people don't understand. There is a purpose in the process of everything. We, we, we want to just go through the drive through of life, beep the horn, get our life, and go. No, you have to go through a process. If you have an option of taking an elevator or the stairs, always take the stairs. Because then you'll understand what it took to get somewhere. I hope all of you understood that. So now for three months, I've got this patch in my eye. You want to talk about discouragement. You want to talk about frustration. And I'm ready to quit. Me, Bill Wilson. The guy whose commitment is stronger than his emotions. I'm going to quit. Because all of you will be there at one point. I was. You will be too. If you haven't been already. I had actually bought the ticket to leave New York. It's one thing to talk about quitting and leaving. It's another thing to buy the plane ticket. I was leaving New York, quitting the ministry, and wasn't even going to tell anybody. And it was a Sunday morning. I was going to go. And uh, couldn't sleep, obviously. I knew the next day I was walking away from everything that I had invested my life into. It had come to that point. I remember looking at the clock about 3 a.m. I guess I dozed off for a few hours. I'd set the alarm for 6. The alarm went off. I turned on the light. My pillow was covered with blood. And I could see fine out of both eyes. Somewhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., God came. Nobody laid hands on me. There was no anointing of oil. All that's good, and it's important, but it didn't happen with me. But in the miraculous sovereignty of God. See, and this is why most people never see their miracle, because they don't stay around long enough. I'm telling you, listen to me. If you stay long enough, it may come down to the last minute, as it did with me, but if you stay long enough, God comes. God comes. So be reminded of that, folks. Be reminded of that. Because the pain will come. The hurt will come. None of us are exempt. The discouragement will come. But it's all designed to get you to quit. But if you make a decision, Lord, I'm trusting you through this. Because you can never see around the corner. Please don't miss this. You can never see around the corner from where you are. You can see to the corner, but you can't see around it. But if you see the one who sees around the corner, that's really all you need to see. And once you understand that principle, that will move you into a whole new mentality of being to understand what you're being prepared for, if you're willing to go through the process. I think one of the most painful parts of anyone's life is when they feel like they're moving in the right direction 
and they're really seeing their life start to take shape, no matter what shape it is. But you have this preconceived notion of where you feel the Lord wants you to go. And when we started the Sunday school in 1980 in Brooklyn, we started on our first weekend with a thousand kids. First day, thousand and ten kids. Well, I mean that that's a miracle in itself. And and it was very exciting. But because of the amount of kids and the kind of kids that we were reaching, which weren't the typical church kids, uh, the one church that we were renting kicked us out. Then we rented another church. And they kicked us out. Isn't it funny? You can be in an area called the ghetto. And even the churches in the ghetto don't want to reach the kids in the ghetto. Isn't that funny? It's interesting, isn't it? And it was a very frustrating time. Very frustrating. We kept being bounced around from building to building. And we were running out of places to meet folks, quite honestly. So we finally ended up in this warehouse um, there on Broadway that runs in Brooklyn. And uh, I rented the building under the presupposition that it had heat. So it was wintertime. We got in the building. The boiler was broke. There was no heat. We were out of places to go, and I realized that th- that was it. It was 17 degrees outside, 17 degrees inside. Uh, many of the kids that came to Sunday school uh, didn't even have coats. They came in shorts and T-shirts in this cold, harsh New York weather. And I remember, because our Sunday school then was just on Saturday. Now, of course, it's six days a week. But in those days, in the, in the infant stages, it was just Saturday. And I remember that Saturday, and I got up on the hood of one of the Sunday school buses, and I have this megaphone, and I told the kids that this was the last day that we could do Sunday school. And I remember looking at the kids, standing there, snow on the ground, some of them there with flip-flops, t-shirt, shorts, and they were crying, I was crying, but it was impossible, we'd run out of buildings, we'd run out of money. That was it. As quickly, now listen to me, as quickly as this thing had mushroomed and and exploded, now it's done. How do you justify that spiritually? How do you put that together mentally, emotionally? And now what do you do? Because remember, when I went there, most of the folks had told me, you won't last. So had the prophecy come true? Had all the preachers and all the negative people and all the naysaying Christians who had done their best to convince me that it was impossible to do anything in a place like that with a group of kids that were hopeless? Has, it, has this it? Has it come to that? How do you raise money for something that you're not doing? It was hard enough to raise money for it while we were actually doing it. Now, we're not doing it. The staff left, all of them. I'll try to explain this to you the best way I can. I made a decision to stay. Now, the Sunday school ended up being shut down for almost a year. How do you explain that to people? How do you go out and try to share a vision that now has become extinguished how do you communicate faith when you put faith in a project that now has disappeared those are the hard questions aren't they yeah and those are the hard times those are the times when everything in you when everything in you tells you to go Go back to where you came from, just like Peter went back to fishing. Go back to the life you used to know. Go back to being an associate pastor. At least you'd have a place to live. At least you could maybe have an income. At least maybe you could salvage something of a life of ministry. But I knew in my heart that if I could somehow endure if I could somehow stay with it, that this was a test. Did I hear an audible voice? No, I did not. I never have. 
But if you've ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs, many of you haven't, you need to. You'll see that many of the men and women that have gone before you and I had to go through some times that were very difficult. I've stood in the Colosseum in Rome, in the very place where Christians gave their life because they believed in Christ. I stood in the Mamertine prison where Paul was before he walked out and was beheaded. I've walked the Jericho Road myself. What does that mean to you? It means there will come a time when your faith will be tested. Do you really believe what you say you believe? Or is it only a belief of convenience when things go well? Because when everything comes down on you, and it will, and it's trying to press you and crush you, and the devil wants to sift you as wheat, what you going to do? They left. I stayed. I stayed. And one of the kids who used to go to the Sunday school came up to me. He was on his bike, and he saw me on the street. And he said, Pastor Bill, I think I found a building. The kids were looking for a building. Isn't that a classic? And I'd been looking. I couldn't find anything. And I went to look at the building, and they, uh, they wanted to sell it. said, I can, can't buy anything. We have no money. We can rent it. He said, it's for sale or nothing. And it was two weeks after that, I was invited for te- to Texas. We had to come up with a $25,000 down payment. And in two weeks, in two churches in the uh, Dallas area, uh, we raised $26,000. And as quickly as it had stopped, now we have the money to get back in another building. I don't know what you're going to go through. I don't know what you've been through. But I know this. There will come a time when your faith will be tested. And you're going to be standing on a corner somewhere, probably by yourself. And then we'll see what you're made of. Because until your faith is tested, you really don't know what real faith is. But you will someday. And when that time comes, it's not... It's not what some people would call a rejection. It's an opportunity to let God do something in your life that he was wanting to do all along. You just never gave him the chance. 